We took care of Frankenstein. Now it's time to do something about Dracula. When it comes to Dracula film series, the choice is a no-brainer. The Hammer series. It's really the only solid string of Dracula sequels that exists. Nothing compares to it. Starting off, we have Horror of Dracula. Though in its native England, it was just called Dracula. I think it needs the full title. It was the first color Dracula movie, and they don't waste any time showing some blood. Who's bleeding? What's bleeding? Why is it dripping on the coffin? Who cares? It's gratuitous color blood. Audiences hadn't seen anything like it. As far as the storyline is concerned, it's not that special. It's another abridged retelling of Dracula. The 1931 classic with Bela Lugosi strayed far from the Bram Stoker novel, but the basic gist was the same. You would think the Hammer version would take the opportunity to stick closer to the novel, but instead, it strays even further. In the novel, Jonathan Harker is a real estate agent who goes to Transylvania to sell Dracula a property in London. In the movie, he goes to apply for a job as Dracula's librarian. But his true motive is to hunt down and kill the Count, so he's already aware that Dracula is a vampire, whereas in the novel, he doesn't know. Also, Harker is defeated by Dracula's power and becomes a vampire himself. Early in the film, Van Helsing finds his living dead corpse and stakes him in the heart to free his soul. In the novel, Harker never becomes a vampire and lives till the end. Also in the novel, Jonathan is engaged to Mina and Arthur is engaged to Lucy. But in the movie here, they swap the relationships around. Now Jonathan is engaged to Lucy and Arthur is married to Mina. Don't you love being confused for no good reason? In the novel, Dracula has the ability to shapeshift. But in the movie, he doesn't do anything of the sort. He doesn't even turn into a bat like the Lugosi version. He also never travels on boat to England. The one most glaring thing omitted was the character Renfield. Think about it, a Dracula movie without Renfield? Even the 1922 version, Nosferatu, had Renfield. Even though it excludes some of the popular Dracula traditions, it still comes out strong. The sets are amazing, from the castle interior to the foggy cemetery. It's much more elaborate than any Dracula film before. Director Terence Fisher would become one of the all-time great horror directors. Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee became the new hot horror actors and were paired in several upcoming Hammer classics. They were the new Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. Peter Cushing is probably the best Van Helsing ever. He plays the part with conviction and class. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. I believe every word that comes out his mouth. He wants to get his damn vampire, and nothing's gonna stop him. Christopher Lee plays Dracula with a dual personality. At first, he's a kind and gentle host. Then the switch goes off, and he's a rabid, blood-drooling beast of the night. Michael Goff is also very good as Arthur Holmwood, who goes through a transition. First, he's a skeptic to the supernatural, then he becomes slowly convinced by Van Helsing. The final confrontation between Van Helsing and Dracula is one of the most classic and iconic fights between good and evil ever put on film. Van Helsing pulls down the window shade and Dracula is destroyed by sunlight. We get the privilege of seeing his body actually decay, something that would usually be considered too gruesome for the 50s. In fact, Hammer had a long fight with the censors and had to remove many of the shots where Dracula's face is decomposing. Somebody in Japan has found an old film print of the missing shots. They're working on getting it restored and clearing the legal bullshit. Hopefully we can see these missing shots one day because it would mean a lot for film history and special effects in general. Even without these extra shots, you don't notice whatever you're missing. It's still an impressive vampire death scene. But Dracula wasn't dead for good. Christopher Lee played Dracula more times on screen than anybody else. In total, seven movies. And that's just for Hammer. He also played the Count in the Italian Jesus Franco film, Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. And he was also in a French comedy called Dracula and Son. But we're going to focus on the Hammer series. So get ready, that's six Dracula sequels coming up. Hammer's first Dracula film was a huge success. But the first sequel, Brides of Dracula, didn't have Christopher Lee, although Peter Cushing returned as Van Helsing. It's definitely worth checking out, and I don't mean to skip over it, but it's not really part of the Dracula series, as far as the character Dracula is concerned. So we're moving ahead to Dracula, Prince of Darkness. 
It opens with a recap from the ending of the first movie, similar to the Rocky movies. This further reinforces that this is a direct continuation of Horror of Dracula, and Brides of Dracula is somewhat irrelevant. Peter Cushing, unfortunately, is not in it, and he's not in many of the Draculas from this point on. He was busy at the time performing consistently as the Mad Doctor in Hammer's Frankenstein series. This also happens to be the last Dracula film directed by Terence Fisher. The plot follows a group of English tourists in the Carpathian Mountains. While at a pub, they meet a priest who warns them not to go near the castle. Ooh, what castle could that be? Well, of course, that's exactly where they end up. It's an old cliché, travelers having to spend the night at a creepy place. It goes all the way back to the old dark house, and it follows all the way through to the modern slasher genre, where young people are on vacation or are out exploring and go somewhere they shouldn't. The castle is inhabited by Dracula's servant, Clove, who says he always keeps the castle prepared for guests in honor of his master. And they all think to themselves, hmm, Dracula must have been a good guy. Since when did Dracula have a servant anyway? Clove wasn't in the first movie, but it doesn't matter. Like the Universal films, the continuity is loose. Anyway, his true intention is to resurrect his master. He murders one of the guests and hangs his body above Dracula's coffin. It's a creepy scene which plays out like an evil ritual. Then he slits his throat as the blood pours over Dracula's ashes. Then Dracula begins to take shape. It's an awesome transformation. Dracula is back and more badass than before. He's a sexual predator, preying on women and then tossing them aside when he's bored. He's the pimp of the undead. He never says a single word the whole movie. Supposedly, Christopher Lee hated the dialogue, so he refused to speak any of it. I'm not sure how much of that is true, but it's not too out of the ordinary because he doesn't speak during the second half of the first movie either. Once his vampire side comes out, he becomes a mute monster. Christopher Lee didn't like being in the sequels. He felt Hammer was wasting their opportunity with the Dracula character because they were writing the stories first and then trying to fit in Dracula after the fact. And in general, they had very little to do with Bram Stoker's novel. For a sequel, it has a bit more references to the novel than you'd expect. Certain things that were dropped from the first movie are present here. Renfield is in it, even though it's a small part, and we only know it's him because of his interest in a fly. Also, the scene where Dracula cuts open his chest and makes his female victim drink his blood is also from the novel. And before, no Dracula movie ever attempted to portray this gruesome concept. There's also a horrific staking scene. In the final scene, Dracula fights the hero on a frozen castle moat while the ice cracks around them. They had to come up with a new way to kill Dracula instead of sunlight again, so they established that a vampire can also be killed by running water. Yeah, water. You could probably kill a vampire by looking at him funny. So the Prince of Darkness is trapped under ice and lay frozen until the next films, which were becoming more frequent. Final thoughts. The storyline is very simple and it's not as groundbreaking as the first one, but in some ways, I like it better. There's a lot of suspense building up to Dracula's resurrection and the tension is consistent the whole movie. It doesn't try too hard to top the first one. It just keeps it steady and tense and comes out being a great solid sequel. <laughs> Dracula has risen from the grave. You gotta love the title and the title screen itself. The movie begins with the discovery of a dead girl in a church. The bite marks on her neck clearly indicate that she's been killed by Dracula. Then we jump ahead a year later and Dracula is dead, frozen under the ice, which is exactly how he ended up last time. So wait, let's back up. If we're continuing from where the last movie left off, then who's the girl? She wasn't in the last movie, so when did Dracula have time to run off, kill a random girl, and hang her in a church bell? I feel like this opening scene is really unnecessary. Anyway, Dracula's dead in the ice, but people are still superstitious and frightened of the castle. A priest decides that maybe they'll feel better if he goes to the castle, says a prayer, and hangs a cross on the door. Unfortunately, there's another priest with him who falls on the ice, cracks it, and somehow manages to bleed straight into Dracula's mouth. And that's all it takes for him to come back. Not to mention, we see Dracula's reflection. This, I guess, is another movie where they didn't establish the lore. Christopher Lee was still refusing the Dracula role, but Hammer kept begging him. 
Just to paraphrase Lee from interviews, he said he was told that if he didn't play the part, he would be putting people out of work. He's the most reluctant horror icon. Even if he didn't like it, he's awesome. He doesn't have many lines, but when he does, it always feels important. Now my revenge is complete. Dracula doesn't have many scenes, which isn't that uncommon. Even the novel focused on the characters who were trying to fight Dracula. Dracula was never in the forefront of the story. Whether or not this is a good Dracula movie depends how much you care about the main characters. In this regard, I think it's one of the best. The hero is a guy named Paul, played by Barry Andrews. He's not your typical vampire hunter. He's just a regular guy who doesn't even know anything about Dracula until he has to save his girlfriend, Maria, played by the beautiful Veronica Carlson. One of my favorite scenes is when he comes to dinner to meet her parents. Her father happens to be a priest and keeps asking him about where he goes to church. He reveals that he's an atheist. Even though he's respectful about it and is just trying to be honest, the father flips out. I think making him an atheist was a clever idea because that makes it harder for him to fight Dracula. You see, the running theme in all these movies is the power of good over evil. Dracula is repelled by holy signs like the cross, but since Paul doesn't believe in that, that means Dracula can overcome. He drives a stake into Dracula's heart, but it doesn't kill him because he needs to pray too. Normally the stake would be enough, but this movie changes the myth a little bit. I like that Dracula throws the stake back. His real death scene is much more symbolic. He happens to fall on a cross, representing good over evil, and then Paul finds his faith. You want to know something really weird? This movie is rated G by the Motion Picture Association of America. That's the equivalent of a children's cartoon, yet it has not one, but two stabbing scenes. Both are shown in explicit detail. There's blood coming out the eyes for fuck's sakes. This should be PG-13, at least PG. Of course, there was no rating system back then. Actually, it's a little bit iffy because the film came out the same year the rating system went into effect. So we can assume the MPAA went back and rated this movie without even watching it. Hmm, Dracula has risen from the grave? That's kind of like Care Bears, right? Yeah, give it a G. What were they thinking? The beginning is a bit clumsy and illogical, but the rest is pretty good. I'm interested in what's going on with the main story and not just waiting around for Dracula to show up. It's not the same Van Helsing story rehashed again, and it's not the cliché travelers wander into an old house story. This one is fresh and new. Taste the blood of Dracula. It's either one of the most brilliant of the series or one of the most idiotic, depending which way you look at it. What I love about it is the first act. The build-up to Dracula's resurrection is the most interesting of all. It centers around three men who are bored out of their minds. They go out at night to whorehouses, and they just don't know what to do with themselves. So they meet this guy, this wonderful nutcase named Lord Courtley, played by Ralph Bates, who happens to be a Satanist and wants to resurrect Dracula. Doesn't that sound like a fun idea? I mean, how bored could you be to bring back the Prince of Darkness? They don't know exactly what they're in for, but they go along with the plan. The first step is to buy the remains of Dracula. The shopkeeper is a man who collects rare things. He happened to be conveniently wandering through the woods in time to witness Dracula being killed in the last movie. He's kept his powdered blood, cape, and rings safe ever since, and is extremely reluctant to selling them. Getting the different parts to resurrect Dracula, I think, may have been the inspiration for the game Castlevania II, Simon's Quest. They buy the items and go to an abandoned church that's been converted into a place for satanic rituals. It's one of the creepiest and most demonic scenes in classic horror history. Courtly wears Dracula's cape and jewelry, says some evil chants, cuts his hand, turns Dracula's powdered blood back into real blood, fills their goblets with it, and orders them to drink. They refuse, so he drinks it himself, and then convulses in agony until they beat him to death with their canes. Later that night, he transforms into Dracula. The rest of the men go back to their families and try to keep everything a secret, while Dracula stalks and kills them all one by one like a slasher villain. The reason Dracula wants to kill them all is out of revenge for killing Courtly, his servant. But wasn't it Dracula's blood that caused him to start gagging to death? 
and aren't they all partially responsible for bringing Dracula back to life? He should be thanking them. It makes no sense. Dracula doesn't say much, as usual. In fact, he rarely even speaks a full sentence. I've counted the Count's words, and it comes out to 28. The most horrible person in the movie actually isn't Dracula. It's one of the men who participated in the ceremony. He's played by Jeffrey Keen. This character is a complete asshole. He's cruel to his family, and he never lets his daughter out of the house. Yet, he goes out to whorehouses. He comes home drunk and tries to whip her for going to see her boyfriend. Notice some jealousy there. Man, he's fucked up. He's the real villain of the movie, and he deserves everything he gets coming to him. Her boyfriend happens to be named Paul, which was the same name as the guy in the last movie. You think they could have come up with a different name? In the end, he decorates the church with candles and crosses, making it a holy place once again. When Dracula returns, he doesn't know how to handle it. Wait, he just suddenly noticed that window had a cross? Shouldn't he have thought about that before choosing a church as his headquarters? He looks around at all the holy imagery, falls down, and crumbles into dust. They couldn't come up with a better idea to kill Dracula? Usually seeing a cross would scare him away or burn his skin, but not kill him. And just by looking at them? Couldn't he have just shut his eyes? This movie happens to be rated R, but the last one was rated G. Both of these movies are on the same DVD set, and you can see on the back the ratings right next to each other. G and R. That's two polar opposites. What was so different about this movie? Maybe there is a little bit more blood in it, and okay, there is a little nudity this time, but G and R? Maybe PG-13 and R. The MPAA had no clue what they were doing. Taste the Blood of Dracula is an uneven entry in the series. It has a great beginning, but after that, it goes downhill. By the end of the 60s, Hammer's horror series were running out of steam, so they decided to reboot both the Frankenstein and Dracula series, fresh and new, and release them on a double bill in 1970. The films were Horror of Frankenstein and Scars of Dracula. Even though they were trying to start Dracula over again, they included a resurrection scene, as if they couldn't make up their mind. The movie literally opens with a fake bat flying in and randomly spitting blood on a Dracula's ashes. And there you go, Dracula's back. If they couldn't come up with a better idea, why even include the resurrection scene at all? It's a reboot. I'd talk about the plot, but there isn't much of one. The main character is a guy named Paul. What else? It's always Paul! Hammer named their movie characters the same way George Foreman named all his sons. Well, Paul, again, is on the run from the law. After 30 minutes of meaningless wandering, he ends up at, where else, Dracula's castle. Dracula treats him as a guest and actually speaks a great deal of dialogue for once. At this point, it starts to play out like the original novel where Jonathan Harker arrives at the castle. Only problem, this has already been done in the first movie. Paul is seduced by Dracula's vampire girl and ends up sleeping with her. When they awake the following morning, she tries to bite his neck, but Dracula barges in. Without missing a beat, Paul tries to strangle his host. Dracula throws him aside, withdraws a knife, and begins stabbing the fucking crap out of her. This would have been very appropriate had it been a slasher film, and if this was a psychopathic killer instead of Dracula. It's amazing. I'm shocked speechless every time I see it. The only thing better would be to see Dracula with a machine gun. Some people have questioned why a knife would kill a vampire, but hey, in the novel, Dracula's killed by a knife, well, two knives. Then he bends down and starts to drink her blood. Well, that's what we can assume, but they cut the scene. Originally, there was supposed to be more footage of Dracula drinking the blood from her corpse, you might ask, why would Dracula drink blood from somebody who's already dead? Well, why does he use a knife? What's wrong with this movie? Paul ends up getting trapped in the castle, and the rest of the movie follows his brother and his girlfriend who go to the castle looking for him. They find Paul dead on a meat hook, and then they have to fight Dracula. That's the best way I can describe the plot without talking about every incident that happens. That's all it is, a series of incidents. Granted, it gives Christopher Lee a lot more screen time than usual, it goes back to its gothic roots with angry villagers, and it draws a few elements from the novel, like when Dracula climbs up the wall. 
It also has some brief nudity, some major cleavage, and the gore is cranked up high. Dracula tortures his servant with a burning poker stick, a priest gets his face picked apart by a bat, and there's close-ups of people's mangled faces. It savors every bloody detail. Dracula's death scene is as random as his resurrection, yet it's the most spectacular since his death by sunlight in the first movie. He's holding a metal pole and is struck by lightning. Call it divine intervention if you will, it's still pretty random. If you want to describe this movie to someone, all you need is three words. Dracula on fire. It doesn't get any better than that. And it goes on for a whole minute. Sometimes it's Christopher Lee, sometimes it's a stunt guy, and other times it's a dummy. Eventually, Dracula flies off the castle like a burning meteor, and the movie ends abruptly. Scars of Dracula has some great highlights, but overall, it's just a rehash of everything that's already been done. The characters are flat, the storyline is uninspired, but enjoyable nonetheless. It's some first-rate horror trash. Dracula AD 1972 is another reboot. It starts over again and marks the return of Peter Cushing to the series as Van Helsing. It begins right away with Van Helsing and Dracula fighting each other. It doesn't bullshit around. It gives you exactly what you want to see from the very start. Dracula is impaled on the wheel of a coach, crumbles away to dust, then some random person comes in and collects the dust in a vial. Can't say that's never happened before. Then the credits begin and what? An airplane? Funk music? Cranes? Cars? That's right, we're now in the present time. Like the title says, it's 1972. Next thing, we're watching people singing and dancing. And it goes on and on and on. A bunch of hippies get together to partake in the traditional resurrection of Dracula. Haven't we seen this before? An evil ceremony led by a crazed lunatic who cuts his hand and bleeds into a goblet? It's the same exact thing that happened in Taste the Blood of Dracula, but done much poorer. And of course, this guy becomes Dracula's servant. I like how Dracula doesn't even thank him for bringing him back. In other words, I'm Dracula, bitch! Even though the film takes place in the present day 70s in which it was made, it doesn't forget its gothic roots. Dracula's headquarters is still a gloomy, broken-down castle which looks just as amazing as ever. Peter Cushing also plays a descendant of Van Helsing who happens to look exactly like him. He is just as good as always, even though he doesn't have much new material to work with. How many times do we need to hear him tell the legend of the vampire? Unlike Christopher Lee who hated being typecast, Peter Cushing embraced it. He plays the part serious no matter how ludicrous the subject matter may be. Hell, the movie could be about rabbits shooting lasers at robot elephants. He'd still treat it like he's trying to win an Academy Award. Bond girl and model Caroline Monroe is in there, but she's only in the dancing scene, the resurrection scene, and then she's killed by Dracula. Too bad. Dracula's servant is a guy named Johnny Alucard. Every time there's a character named Alucard in one of these movies, There's always a scene where somebody's writing down the name just to show that it's Dracula spelled backwards. The same thing happened in Son of Dracula in 1943. It's also incredibly coincidental that this Alucard guy looks exactly like the guy in the beginning who collects Dracula's remains. I can understand the reason to keep Peter Cushing as both versions of Van Helsing, but does every generation in this movie have to be the same actor? It doesn't make any sense. Unless maybe Alucard's the same character who's been holding Dracula's remains and hasn't aged in a hundred years. Van Helsing re-establishes that running water can kill a vampire and furthermore states that they can be killed by silver as well. And he uses both. He kills Alucard in a shower and then in the final fight against Dracula, he stabs him with a silver knife. But the Count doesn't stay down for long. Van Helsing's granddaughter, under Dracula's control, pulls the knife out and that's all it takes to bring him back. But Van Helsing has a plan B. He lures Dracula into an Indiana Jones-style booby trap full of wooden spikes. He burns his face with holy water and forces him onto the spikes with a shovel as blood spurts everywhere. This is a great ending, but you can't take it seriously with all that funk music going on. What's the deal with that? It makes sense to have that kind of music during the dancing scenes, but not during the horror scenes. It would be like watching Godzilla with polka music. It doesn't fit. 
The movie generally gets negative reactions, but I don't think it's that disappointing. Sure, it takes a big risk by setting it in the present time, but it carries enough of the horror goods we come to expect. We get both Lee and Cushing back together like good old times, and get two Van Helsing vs. Dracula bouts for the price of one. The beginning and ending are great, but the middle is crap. It's a shit sandwich. The Satanic Rites of Dracula, the final Hammer Dracula movie with Christopher Lee. This is the one I've seen the least amount of times. Now that I've watched it again, I've been reminded why. It's an incredibly bizarre mixture of horror, science fiction, and espionage. It's considered to be a sequel to Dracula AD 1972. Other than the fact it's set in the same time period, it has very little connection. It comes off as a completely different film. The tone is much darker, and it takes itself very seriously. It doesn't draw attention to its 1970s time period. There's no hippies, bell-bottoms, or funk music. Dracula's resurrection is not shown or explained in any detail. He just shows up randomly at a half hour into the movie and is never seen often until the last 20 minutes. Christopher Lee always said that Dracula seemed tacked on as if they wrote the story first and then thrown in Dracula after the fact. For this one, it couldn't be more true. There's all these satanic rituals going on, and spies running around. It's as far removed from Dracula as possible, and doesn't even feel like a Hammer film. It's very slow moving, 90% of the scenes are people sitting around in rooms talking. The good news is that Peter Cushing is in a lot of it. He's the star and single-handedly carries the movie, even though most of what he does is just give exposition. It's an exposition extravaganza with Van Helsing explaining stuff all the time. Every vampire rule in the book is mentioned. They don't cast a reflection or even show up in photographs. He lists all the ways a vampire can be killed. Running water, silver's mentioned again, and a new one is added to the list, a hawthorn bush. Dracula's evil scheme goes far beyond biting the necks of luscious young ladies. Now get ready for this. This is the part where you'd either say the series completely jumps the shark or becomes more awesome than ever. Dracula is working on developing a new form of bacteria similar to the bubonic plague that will kill everyone in the world. This brings Dracula to a whole new level of supervillain. He is the devil and he is the Armageddon. That is pretty cool, but you might be wondering how Dracula would survive without fresh blood to feast on. Van Helsing's theory is that Dracula is a cursed immortal wanting to end his own wretched existence and take the whole universe down with him. For the last Dracula movie to star Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, it gives them both their moments to shine. Cushing has a doomy monologue where he talks about the Armageddon. But suppose he, just suppose he yearns for final peace, wouldn't he? He'd want to bring down the whole universe with him. The ultimate revenge. And Lee has some great lines and escalates his voice in a way that we haven't heard yet. Four horsemen of my created apocalypse. Four carriers of the plague who will infect their miserable brethren. You, Van Helsing, are now one of the four. It's the most evil speech ever spoken by Dracula in the whole series. It's moments like this I love, but there are silly moments as well. Van Helsing plans to kill Dracula with a silver bullet, something that's usually used for a werewolf, but whatever. He melts a silver cross and uses that to make the bullet. I think it's a little excessive. Isn't it enough that it's silver? Does it have to be a cross too? Then he meets up with a guy named Denim who he suspects to be Dracula. We only see this Denim guy in this one scene, and it's no surprise that he's Dracula. We've already seen Dracula earlier in the film, and he doesn't change his appearance in any way. Although he talks in a different accent here. It's really weird. It sounds a little bit like Bela Lugosi. So Van Helsing secretly slips a Bible onto his desk. When Dracula touches it, it burns his hand, making his true identity known. So a Bible can burn Dracula? Man, he is so vulnerable. Van Helsing tries to shoot the silver bullet at him. Think he could have found a smaller gun? One of Dracula's servants screws up his aim. Too bad he only made one bullet. Much later, Dracula and Van Helsing have a showdown in a burning house. It's classic stuff. Then Dracula follows Van Helsing outside, where there conveniently happens to be a hawthorn bush. Dracula walks into it like a dumbass and is stuck with thorns all over his body. He falls down and resembles Jesus Christ with the crown of thorns. 
Then Van Helsing uses a piece of the fence as a stake and rams it into Dracula's body while he convulses in agony and crumbles away to dust for the final time. In conclusion, it's a mixed bag. The majority of it is too slow and is the weakest of the series, but a few highlights and a great ending make it worthwhile for any classic horror fan. The original working title was Dracula is Dead and Well and Living in London, which is ridiculous. The original American title was Count Dracula and His Vampire Bride. For some reason, this is the only one of the Hammer Draculas to slip into the public domain. That means you can find it on any of those cheap bargain DVD sets. The rest of the series is a bit confusing to find on DVD. The first one, along with 3, 4, and 6, are on a quad pack from Warner Brothers. Number 5, Scars of Dracula, is on an Anchor Bay DVD with bonus features and commentary with Christopher Lee, but unfortunately it's out of print and expensive to find on Region 1. Number 2, Dracula Prince of Darkness, and number 7, Satanic Rites of Dracula, are on a double DVD also from Anchor Bay and with a Christopher Lee commentary on the Dracula Prince of Darkness portion, but again it's out of print. Anchor Bay, or Hammer, or whoever owns the rights to these out-of-print editions seriously needs to get their shit together and re-release them. It would be nice if all these movies could be owned by the same company and released on one set, but I won't hold my breath for it. There is one more Hammer movie to feature Dracula, Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, a martial arts horror crossover. Peter Cushing is in it, but Christopher Lee is not. They actually got somebody else to play Dracula and is only on screen for a few minutes. I happen to review this one already as part of last year's Monster Madness. Well, starting tomorrow, we're going to spend a week with a certain horror villain from the 80s.